Hello, I'm Daniel Pavla. I'm a professor here at Concordia University, Wisconsin, and I'm very thankful that I get to spend this time sharing with you some ideas about the Lord's Prayer. I know it's a familiar piece and part and heart of much of our uh, devotion life, something you have said over and over and over again, of course, and said it rightly and well. But I've had the opportunity in the last uh, year or two to write a book for Concordia Publishing House. It's called Our Way Home. And it's a journey through the Lord's Prayer. And on that journey, I hope that I can share in these next minutes uh, some unique aspects, uh, images, and, and ideas about the Lord's Prayer that will be helpful to you, uh, not only in your devotional life, but also in your life of serving and caring for others, which I know you do so well. And so uh, I'll be walking my way through again, through much of the ideas and materials from the book. Uh, of course, the book is 200 pages and we only have a few minutes. Uh, so there's much more to be read there if you choose and uh, we'd be glad of that. So let's start though with the idea of the Lord's Prayer and, and the idea of a journey. Uh, before I was a, professor, and that's what I am, a professor of theology here at Concordia, for 12 years, I was a parish pastor in Butternut, Wisconsin. I say that with great love for Butternut, Wisconsin, a town of 400 people in the far north woods of Wisconsin, deep in the Schwamga National Forest. We're just south of Lake Superior, on the shores of Lake Superior, or near it. And so it is cold country with wonderful, warm-hearted people. Uh, being a parish pastor meant that uh, at least twice a year, we had new members classes. And my new members classes, adults, were made up uh, half and half. Uh, half of those adults from different denominations who were wanting to join us, and half the current Lutherans who were coming with them and uh, you know joining them in their journey to become a Lutheran uh, part of our congregation. What do you say about prayer? Uh, for my Lutheran friends and members, they had already had catechism and confirmation class. And so it had to be something different. Otherwise, we'd bore them for an hour. Uh, for those who were coming to us from a number of denominations, it couldn't be so different from what they'd known that they were left behind. So I developed this idea of the Lord's Prayer as a journey. The Lord's Prayer is familiar to uh, everyone in a Christian denomination. And uh, yet, hopefully, we can say something that's a bit distinctive. With that, let's start the journey. It begins with our Father who art in heaven. Have you ever prayed a window shade prayer? Now, my, my window is, is right over here. And um, if to animate this, I could run over there and have you imagine a window shade. So could you just imagine a window shade? Of course. That's the kind that we have in our bedroom. You know, you reach up, you grab on, kung, 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 you pull the thing down. If you don't latch it securely and you let go, you all know what happens. Bop, 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 that horrible sound that goes rattling up. What's a window shade prayer? Well, I think it's when we reach up to God and you have to reach kind of really a long way up because after all, he's in heaven and you bring him down here to tell him a few things. You tell him things that, well, it seems he's missed because at least as far as you and I can see, nothing's changed. So he must not know about them. So we reach up, we get his attention, we bring him down here, we show him the things that are here that, well, need doing. And then when we're done with it and with him, we let him go and back up he goes hopefully to get going on those things that we just asked him to take care of. Is that the Lord's prayer or any prayer? Well, hopefully not. We do begin by saying our father who art in heaven. Oh, but that's not a window shade prayer. Saying our father art in heaven acknowledges that God is in heaven, but it also says, that's where he hears us. Isn't that a wonderful thought? That's where he hears us, though we're here. We're not taken up there as in bodily form and anything like that. But God hears us in heaven. And that's where our prayers go. 
An image that I bet you you knew when you were a seventh grade acolyte works with this. I used to teach our acolytes, the seventh graders and eighth graders, this little image of thought, and I'm, I'm sure you had it, that as they put out the candles, the smoke rises upward. Isn't that a lovely thought? As the smoke rises upward, so do the prayers of his people. I've always liked that thought, that image of the smoke going up. As we finish the service and we're saying our last prayers, and usually we're saying them privately, it's a time for us to give thanks that we're forgiven, to ask for his protection, to ask one more time that he'd attend to our families or other worries that we have. As the smoke rises upward, so do the prayers of his people. Well, and they do because our Father is in heaven. You know, that image of our Father in heaven, I hope is one of, of light and, and warmth and welcome. Uh, I said I, I grew up on a dairy farm in Western Minnesota and uh, we had a almost half mile long driveway uh, leading from the county road to our home, to the, the old farmhouse. The light was always on. I could go off, ride my motorcycle somewhere and come home at night and everything else is dark. But my mother always had two lights on. There was always a light on in the kitchen. There was always a yard light on in the yard. As soon as you made that turn, you're still a half mile away on that gravel driveway. You could see the light on. That was really a nice thing. My parents had probably gone to bed because we got up early to milk cows, but the lights were always on. You come home. I hope you have a the lights are on image that says you come home now when we say our father who art in heaven because he welcomes us home to his house, to our home with him. And he's always there, always listening. Now that a marvelous thought so begin with our Father who art in heaven, and he hears us there, and the prayers ascending like the smoke at the end of the, the candles being extinguished, the end of the service, that's you. Go home, the lights are on. Now, what should we, well, what should we say when we get there? It's wonderful to say our Father who art in heaven, but what should we look at? For that, I need to give you a, another image, if I, if I may. Um, let's go on a road trip. Uh, right now, today in Wisconsin, the sun is pouring in from my window there, uh, looking east over Lake Michigan. Uh, our campus is set right on Lake Michigan. It's a beautiful, clear, wonderful day. Well, I'm all for it here in Wisconsin. Let's go out west. Let's go to Montana or someplace beautiful where we drive up into the heights of the mountains. Let's go to some 10,000 foot high peak or pass. And at the top, there's always a, a signpost, such and such, bare tooth pass or something like that. And they give you the elevation, 9,972 feet. And you have a place to park your car because you want to take a picture of that signpost. Let's imagine a long line of cars. People are parked there, okay? And uh, what, well, what are they doing? Well, they're taking pictures, aren't they? They're pointing out to each other. Ooh, ooh, look, look, a bald eagle, I think. Or ooh, 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 bighorn sheep or something, you know. Uh, it's a wonderful scene. Now, imagine in the middle of that, there's one parking spot open. Somebody drives in with their car. He parks it. He gets out. But he doesn't go up to the edge where everyone else is viewing. He looks down the row of cars. He looks down the other side, the other row. He's not happy. He's not seeing what he wants. And then, shaking his head and unhappy, he gets back in his car, he slams the door shut, and as he drives away with the window down, you hear him say, no mirrors. No mirrors. He drove to the top of this 10,000-foot pass looking for a mirror. What would he do if he found a mirror? What would he look at? himself, I suppose. What else would you do with a mirror? If all he did was look at a mirror on the top of this 10,000 foot pass surrounded by all the beauty of creation, there's something wrong with this guy. And when you come up to him and say, friend, why are you wasting your time looking at yourself? Look, have you ever done a mirror on a mountain prayer? 
Now I think we do that too. Along with the, you well, know, sometimes we pray like a window shade. Sometimes we pray like someone looking for a mirror on a mountain. That is, we get to heaven. That is, God listens to us. He assures us that by the light that is always on and by the very naming of himself as our Father who art in heaven. But what's the only thing on your mind? What's the only thing you notice? What's the one thing you're looking for now that you have the chance to speak to God? A mirror. You want to talk about you. I want to talk about me, like an old song says. Isn't that strange? Here we are surrounded by the, the offer to speak to God and the assurance that our Father who is in heaven, in fact, hears us. Yet all we want to do is talk about me. Well, thank goodness the Lord's Prayer doesn't start us out with talking about me. The Lord's Prayer invites us to see what's there, to join in the heavenly choir. We'll get to ourselves. We'll get to the worries and concerns that, well, often make us pray. But let's just give them a little time off to the side. Let's instead take in where we are and what's happening to us. So, as I mentioned just a moment ago, let's join the choir. Our Father art in heaven, the smoke rises upward, so the prayers of his people. And he who is in heaven hears us, for he is in heaven and he is everywhere. Hearing us, what should we say? Well, isn't it wonderful that the prayer then gives us the next thing to say, which is, hallowed be thy name. Oh, now that I have an opportunity to speak to God, maybe I should speak about God. And what could I say? Hallowed be thy name. I'd like you to think about the opportunity that we have with that. Um, I, I'm hoping that you're going to join me on this. Now, I know that many of you have far, far, far more talent than I do, which is good for you. Uh, but I need someone, and I would love if we could be seeing each other face to face on this, who would put your hand up with me on this point. I have never joined or auditioned for a choir, and I'm never going to. Did that include you? I'd kind of like it to for just a moment. I've never auditioned for a choir and I don't plan to. You might ask, why not, Dan? That's because you have not heard me try to sing. I can't sing worth a lick. I have no, I have no musical ability. I said in the book that I have all the rhythm of a man who just stubbed his toe. I, I, I just, I, you, you would not want me to. I can't sing. So no choir wants me to join them. And I understand, no hard feelings but the heavenly choir takes me in every day. Isn't that amazing? Remember that God is not alone in heaven. Revelation 7 would be a wonderful place for you to go. And, and the, the, of course, the book gives many, 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 many references uh, to all the points we're making. But in Revelation 7, we're reminded that God is surrounded by a great crowd that is taken up and made up of every tribe and nation and language. And they surround him, and with the saints, angels, the four living creatures, they surround God with a never-ending chorus. They sing. In other words, there's a heavenly choir. And I'm, I'm sure you and I could agree, I bet they sing really well. They're always in tune. And they let me in. Isn't that remarkable? When you and I say something as simple as, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name we join the choir because the one who hears us hears them and never ceases one or the other. You join the choir. I, I just think that's just the most remarkable thought because I'm never going to join any choir and no choir would want me. But the heavenly choir, so to speak, lets me in. And God welcomes us. Now, when you think of that, it's unlike any other choir, at least any good one. Uh, I have friends in the music department, and of course, and you would know this without asking them, but I've asked them, would it be a good thing 
to uh, listen to a choir perform and then say to the director of the choir, say, your choir sounds wonderful. Especially that, that woman, the second one on the left side in the third row, she really stands out. And my choir directing friends say, no, Dan, that, that would not be good. The idea of singing in the choir is not for the woman on the second row or third or to stand out. You're supposed to fit in, blend in. And unless you happen to be the soloist, don't stand out. But you do. You join the choir, and yet you stand out to the one who listens to your prayers. Isn't God amazing in the balance that he has? We get to join the choir. As we say in the communion liturgy, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, well, we know that part of the liturgy. It's true. It's also true when you pray. You join the saints, the angels, the archangels, and all the company of heaven. You join them, that's good. And yet at the same time, he never ceases to hear you in the choir. Only choir in the world that could be that big, that perfect, and yet welcome each of us and hears each of us, not in reprimand or change, join the choir. Now, we could go on a great deal about what we should say in the choir uh, during that time. Uh, it's all compacted, of course, in hallowed be thy name. Uh, we're all for the name of God. But think of the possibilities of that name. I think this is a point in which we could wonderfully stay, draw it out. When you say, hallowed be thy name, just, just pause a little bit. Enjoy being in the choir. Take in the view. After all, you're speaking to the one who hears you in heaven. What names of God are you thinking of? And which ones especially matter? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, of course. Father, maybe that's especially who you need to both give thanks to and uh, ask for the care and the provisions of a caring, loving Father. The one who's made you, Psalm 139, who knows every word that you're going to speak before you've ever spoken them, who knows us in every detail. A father, Psalm 103, who knows that we are but dust and has compassion on us because of it. That's good. When you say, hallowed be thy name, maybe you center on his son. And think of all the names that go with him. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting. Father, Prince of Peace, oh, others that we know. Maybe you think of him especially as Savior. That's good. Maybe you think of him as Lord. That's good, too. Maybe you picture him as the wonderful 30 years as a carpenter. It's the picture that's right before me on the wall that I'm looking at. Who is he as you need him today? The Holy Spirit. Wonderful. Do you need a comforter? Do you need a counselor? Do you need one who will teach and remind you of all the things that are needed to be known? The older I get, the more I need a teacher and a reminder of things that need to be known. All those are the Holy Spirit. Well, we could go on and on, couldn't we? Oh, my goodness. Think of the long list. And you won't go through the whole list. But pause when you say, hallowed be thy name, and savor the possibilities that his wonderful name brings, both as something we can give thanks for and also something that we can say, Lord, I really need today a father. I really need a comforter. I need a savior. Well, that begins us. And so with that, we've been at our beginning. It's a very good beginning. And so our journey has started at the very highest point. Thy kingdom come is now going to follow, but don't leave too quickly our very wonderful beginning our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name and with that a transition thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven all right when we imagine this journey and uh my my friends at cph who do the the graphic arts for the book and they do it oh so much better than i i'll, I'll just hold this up uh, briefly oh, sorry sorry hold this up briefly for you 
Uh, they picture this wonderfully. Uh, I don't have artistic talents as, as well as I don't have any musical talents. Uh, start very, very high in the journey. And we're now going to take a transitional step as we go linking our Father who art in heaven to on earth as it is in heaven. How do we make that transition from basking, reveling with a choir in heaven to the things that, well, are pressing here on earth? Well, it's this phrase, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For that, I need to tell you a poem. Robert Frost, you probably are familiar with his poetry. Robert Frost in the early part of the 20th century was a Vermont farmer. He then became a poet. And of course, as you know, much of his poetry is about farming, yeah, mending wall, birches, stopping by woods on a snowy evening, poems that I know you know. Uh, the poem that probably is most famous, uh, it's often printed at the start of uh, every collection of Robert Frost poetry, is The Pasture Spring. Uh, let me recite that for you. It's very short, just two, two stanzas. And would you listen especially at the end of each stanza to the key phrase? I'm going to clear the pasture spring. I'll only stop to rake the leaves away and wait to watch the water clear. I may. I shan't be gone long. You come too. I'm going to fetch the little calf that's standing by its mother. It's so young it totters when she licks it with her tongue. I shan't be gone long. You come too. Well, it's that phrase, I shan't be gone long. You come too, that we want. Here's a picture, if you would, a farmer who has chores to do. He's got to clear the pasture spring. He's got to fetch the little calf. By the way, I've done both of those jobs many, 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 many times on the dairy farm I grew up on. We had a creek that had to be cleared out. Uh, and uh, many a young calf gets born out in the pasture. You got to go pick it up and carry it home. I've got chores to do. I can do them alone. Carrying a calf is a one-man job. The two people will not make it any better. But I don't want to do the chores alone. You come too. Well, why? Well, listen to the poem. I'm going to clear the pasture spring, stop to rake the leaves away, and wait to watch the water clear, I may. You rake away the leaves and the brush and the debris that's filled up a creek or a spring, and after you do that for just a moment, it's all oh, two feet deep or something like that, aren't you going to stop and wait and see what is there now that you've cleared all this away? And at some point, you're going to say, oh, look. Well, it'd be awfully better if somebody was there to look with you and so you come too that little calf that's standing by its mother if you've ever seen a calf just born they're cute they're wobbly they stand there they topple they fall they get up they fall over mama licks them she topples them over you're gonna laugh it would be better if i had somebody to laugh with would you come too the bottom line is i have chores to do and i would like to do them with you would you come with me? And that's the wonderful thing. Lord, I'd love to stay in heaven. I'd love to forget all my worries here. I would love to just join the choir and think of your name. And as long as I can, I will. But you know, the prayer moves on because I have to move on. And so would you come too? Would you come, Lord, and bring a measure of heaven here? Now, we know that our world is never going to be transformed to be the Eden it once was and certainly won't be the heaven that we will live in. But aren't we yearning for some measure of what we just left? We were in the heaven. We were in the choir. That some part of that would come with us. And so he graciously gives us this. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, if I may, get, let me give you another uh, image that I think matches that idea of chores and of transformation. Uh, when my wife and I were first married, our very first years, uh, living in tiny little apartments, we would generally in the fall go to the Parade of Homes, uh, tour of homes, builder showcase, pretty much every town has something like this in the fall, you know. Uh, you pay your money, you get 
eight, 10 tickets. You get to go then, of course, to these brand new homes that have just been built and tour them. So let's take the tour. Uh, let's step into the last one, the McMansion of McMansions. And uh, you walk in, of course, take your shoes off or put on the little booties, one or the other. Walk in. What's it like? Oh, my goodness. Of course, everything's new, isn't it? The carpet, oh, new. Everything. Granite countertops, beautiful, new. Fresh cut flowers, beautiful on a vase, on every table. Uh, take in the smell. It's a wonderful smell of new carpet, little uh, little new paint smell left behind, and they put some uh, Rhodes frozen bread dough to to you know bake and and to turn into bread in the oven. Oh, it's a perfect combination. Oh, and don't forget the the fresh cut flowers; they smell good too. Uh, the lawn, oh, it's beautiful. It's perfect. There's not a dandelion or a mm, speck of crabgrass in that lawn. It is perfect. There's also a fountain back there gurgling away. That's lovely, isn't it? I mentioned that Holly and I went to these, especially when we were first married and still living in an apartment, had not, didn't have a home to call our own yet. And uh, But we don't go as often anymore. Haven't really gone for years as much anymore. And that's because, well, what do you have to do at the end of the tour of homes? After you've seen all the mansions, after you step out of this last place that I just described, where do you have to go? You got to go home. I love our home. I'm very happy to go home. But is our home like the mansion that we just left? Oh, good heavens, no. We do not have fresh cut flowers and vases on every table. The carpet is not new. Uh, the furniture is not new. The, uh, the cat that we formerly had could be counted on doing something bad, either swinging like a trapeze back and forth from curtains or, or just, just bad. Why we kept that cat so long, I don't know. Uh, it's not the same. So let's go back to the last mansion. You're standing there. You have to go. And you're so impressed. This place is incredibly beautiful. And a man comes up and he meets you at the door. And, uh, and he says very innocently, by the way, a look at him says he's not just the owner. This man's wearing a tool belt. He's got calloused hands. He clearly is a man who knows to, how to build things and do things. And he stands at the door as you're ready to leave. And he says, well, what did you think? And you say, oh, my gosh, this, this place is incredible. Oh, and he says, well, thank you. I, I enjoyed building it. Well, you did a wonderful job, you say. And then he says, what is your house like? Oh, nothing like this, you say. Oh, my gosh. Oh, don't, don't, even, don't even bring it up. Or nothing like your place. Oh, he says, well, um, would, you ever, would you ever want to work on it? Would you ever want something done on it? Well, you say, oh, I mean, we've been talking about uh, fixing up the living room forever. Oh, and the kitchen, oh, the countertops and the cabinets, oh. But you don't do work like that, do you? You ask him, the builder of the mansion. And he says, oh, I work on all kinds of houses. I work everywhere. Would you work on our house? I mean, after this? He says, of course. When could you start? Right now. Well, then you come too. Isn't that what we hope? We've gone to heaven in our prayers. We've joined the choir. We've glimpsed a bit of the perfection of heaven and God who dwells there. But we're also meeting a carpenter who built for 30 years in humble work that was likely not known or appreciated. And it's the carpenter who meets us now at this point of our prayer, as we know we have to go back to the things that have been troubling to us. We have to firmly land on earth again, in our very familiar part of earth, our earth, our house, our family, our work, our worries. And aren't we saying to him at his kind invitation, would you come too? Would you come with us? Could you make where I live a little more like this place of yours. And again, we know that our home isn't going to be transformed to a mansion 
Our family is not going to be transformed into perfect people. But Lord, could you do something? Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful idea? Uh, Lord, I know it takes time. Nobody ever remodeled anything. It didn't take twice or three times as long as we imagined. But Lord, could you come? And we would be thrilled to know that day by day by day by day, the carpenter is working on our house and will so do so right to the end of time. And so, Lord, would you come? Come. Well, we know that when you come, Lord, we're a long way still from home. We're not arrived yet. And we know that, in fact, as we get older, in fact, some of that which we live in, our, our bodies like a tent, are going to lose some of the newness of which you first created them. That's all right. Because we know at the end that you are not merely working on our house, You're not merely working on where we live, but you're working on us and you're reclaiming us. You restore our souls, as Psalm 23 reminds us, and you'll also reclaim even this body when the end comes and raise it up, transformed to be with you forever and ever. So this is a very powerful and important phrase. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's today, and today we can see and wish the carpenter would come and work where we live and where we work. But it's also about our future. And we know that when we are finally dead, our bodies are buried, our spirits are with him in heaven, that he will also come and raise us up into himself, into heaven. What a powerful phrase. Well, our journey has taken quite a, a long step now, hasn't it? We began with our Father who art in heaven. That's wonderful. And as we began there in the very peak, he has joined us with himself. That is, he's heard our prayers. We've joined in with the choir. We've hallowed his name. We focus not on ourselves. It's not a mirror prayer or a window shade prayer, but a prayer about God. But now he's taken us on the transition and assured us that he's coming with us. And now we're firmly here on earth. The next two petitions, we have our feet, yes, on earth. At the same time, however, I'd like you to think that above, above us, there's a cloud, at least two of them. There are two clouds above us. Those clouds remind us that though I'm here on earth, yet my prayer is still to a father who is in heaven, and there in heaven he hears us, and that's the wonderful hope of our prayer. Well, let's begin with firmly on ground, our father provides our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. I said I was a farm boy in Minnesota. Uh, we live in west central Minnesota by Fargo, North Dakota, the western border. That's dry country for farming. Um, low 20s, uh, 22 inches or so of rain a year, not, a, not an abundance of rain. Uh, the country is just hilly enough that uh, there's really not much irrigation, not where we were, uh, just a little ways away. Yes, they irrigate. But uh, in our area, uh, you depend on what rain comes. If you have enough, good. If you don't, it's a bad year. When I was 20 years old in 1976, we had a terrible drought. It really didn't significantly rain for two months in the heart of summer, June through mid-August. During that time, our crops failed completely. There, there was nothing. Uh, we got a very small first cutting of hay, which was nothing, hardly. Our oats, our corn were gone, just wiped out. We, we didn't even bother to run the combines through the fields. There was nothing to harvest, nothing to pick. Uh, we were dairy farmers. As I said, we still had our full herd. We could only get by by uh, buying hay trucked down from Canada. Uh, very expensive, as you would guess, because it was a drought throughout the whole region. So the prices were very high. It was so bad, in fact, that the coming following spring, having made it through the winter, we sold our herd, changed our life. We continued to farm as, uh, as grain farmers uh, for the next several years. But that drought of 76 was a terrible time. As I said, I was 20 years old. I was home from college, as I was every year. I was home, I was home most weekends, in fact, milking cows uh, with my parents. And um, I remember being on those hills, uh, looking to the west, our, our weather always came from west to east, and watching for clouds, of course. And sometimes, you know, you would see a, a cloud with just a little bit of rain coming out of it. You know those summer clouds where you can see that little bit of rain shooting down? And uh, the cloud would be in the west, 
And of course, where did I want that cloud to come? On top of us, of course, on our farm. And I remember the great frustration I felt as I would watch those clouds and they would head to the north to Perm, that's the town north of us, or south to Battle Lake. And it would rain. It wasn't much rain, by the way. It was just a, a, a sprinkle. But it would sprinkle that amount on them. We were needing that rain. And I didn't want to begrudge Perm and Battle Lake, but come on. Uh, we needed it where we were. I think that's how we feel at times when we're praying this petition. Give us this day our daily bread. Are you standing on a dry hill right now? I bet you are. Uh, you're on a dry hill. That is, there's something that hasn't come yet. In fact, you've been waiting a long time for something to come. Not come from you, not come from the earth, not come horizontally necessarily from others. You've been looking up to God and saying, God, when is that finally going to come? You've been waiting so long, the ground is cracked at your feet. You're not looking at your feet or the cracked earth. You're looking up to the sky. Oh, and what do you notice? It's raining. It's raining the very thing you need, but on somebody else. It's raining in Perm. It's raining in Battle Lake. It's raining the thing you need on your best friend. She has it exactly. It's raining the thing you need on your sister. Their parents always had it. And I could keep on going and going and going. The thing you need, why, it's right there. You, you, you can see it. So it isn't that God doesn't know how to do this. It isn't that God is saying, well, you know, I just, I just don't do that gift anymore. Nobody gets it, so don't even ask. No, no, no. You, you can see it. You need a different job, like the one she has. You, you need a new and a better relationship, like they have. We go on and on. The very thing you need, like rain, God fully knows how to still bring it down. You're watching. And so we ask, Lord, would you bring it here? I'm not greedy. Well, I am at times, but I'm trying not to be greedy at this point and say, take it away from them and give it to me. But rather simply to say, Lord, you know the thing that you're giving to her? You know I need it. I know you know I need it. I know you're the one who has got all the resources, all the gifts in the world. Would you bring that cloud, that shower over me? Well, as we know, it, it does come. It, it comes. In, uh, as I said, in 1976, we had a terrible drought. Three years later, we had one of the most abundant years we ever had. My gosh, we could hardly make it. Well, in fact, we couldn't. Well, in one field, we couldn't get around the field with a combine uh, without having to stop, back up, and unload before because the crop was so good. We've never seen anything like that. Does God know how to give? Absolutely. Does he know how to give in its right time? Absolutely. We can all say that more easily when the giving has happened and we're abundant, but we know it as a truth. But I think this is a wonderful petition where God allows us to say, Lord, I know what you are able to do. I can see it as you rain it on someone else. And I'll ask with both patience, but also some intensity. Give us this day our daily bread. Well, that's what we have so far as he gives us this, this shower. Remember I said now we're on these two petitions, we're firmly on earth, and here firmly on earth, we look up to heaven, all right? Though I'm here, there's a cloud above me, and that cloud above is, first one, a sprinkle, a sprinkle. Maybe it's sprinkling its daily measure on me now, or I'm waiting for it because I see it over someone else. Let's go to the next one. The next one, now put your cloud over here. It is a flood, just a monsoon. I want you to feel as wet, as wet, as wet as you've ever been. Um, you're stuck out in the rain. I mean, no coat, no umbrella, none of the things you should have had just drenched. You you went to, here in Wisconsin, uh, it would be Noah's Ark, the biggest water park, but whatever water park you have, you, you took your kids there, and by the end of the day, my gosh, every part of you was wrinkled because you had just been soaked the whole, whole day. I want you to feel soaked, all right? Now, to put that in perspective, 
our house flooded in 1997. Uh, we moved here to this part of Wisconsin from Butternut. We, are, we live in Cedar Grove um, in 1970, uh, 1996, did I say 97? 1996, we moved here and all was well. But in the summer of 97, our house flooded. We had six inches of rain uh, overnight and into the early morning. And it had rained and rained and rained. And, and before that, everything was saturated. And suddenly our storm system, storm sewer system could not take it. Uh, we are at the bottom of a very gentle decline. You know, we're in Cedar Grove. I guess we're the Grove part. And uh, things you don't know when you buy a house is that that's where the water uh, collects as it comes rushing down uh, from a hill, uh, a field, a quarter mile uh, total away from us that it comes down. And uh, the water built up, built up, built up. It built up so that our house was a complete island. Totally. We have water right up to the basement windows, all the way around the house, right up, up to the step, the front step, uh, creeping into our, our driveway and, or into our, our garage. The driveway was completely under. Uh, in our basement, the sump pump had given up. It, it couldn't do it. Uh, we had a foot of water in our basement and rising. The fire department, bless their hearts, loaded a portable pump, gas powered pump in a canoe and they canoed it up to our driveway. Uh, we've got a wonderful Polaroid picture taken by our neighbor across the street who uh, pictured us uh, this canoe beached in our front door. Open the front door, put the front end of the canoe in our front door. That's just where the water was up to. They carried the pump downstairs and they fired her up. We opened up every window. Carbon monoxide was not our biggest worry at that point. It, it, it's a worry. I'm, I'm all for you being worried. But man, keeping that water out was the key. As fast as the pump pumped, the water kept coming in. So for hours, that pump just held it at bay, a, a foot deep. We were wet, soaked to the bone. I've never been so wet. This is not a day for raincoats or umbrellas. Forget that. You're soaked, soaked, soaked to the bone. I'd like you to picture a couple of things uh, about that, that day. Um, we're soaked to the bone. And I'm standing there at, at one point with that fire department hose. You know, it's about four inches or so. It snaked its way up our steps, down the hallway, out into the garage. And it's push, pushing out into uh, the, the driveway. And, of course, as fast as it's going out, it's coming back in the house. Imagine, now this is all a true story, but imagine at this point something that did not happen. But imagine one of my neighbors just up the hill who wasn't flooded came over with two five-gallon pails, you know, those orange Menards pails, uh, and, uh, and he set them down, and he said, uh, say, Dan, um, could you spare a little water? And I'm standing there with a four-inch fire department hose gushing water out. What should I do? Fill the buckets. Of course. Give them all he wants. In fact, say to him, oh, take it. You want more? You come back. Fast as that's going out, it's going back in. Wouldn't it be bizarre if he came up with just two empty five-gallon pails and he said, say, Dan, could you spare some water? I shut the pump off. And I said, no, 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 no. I'm keeping all this. I kind of like the moat concept, you know. Uh, that would be bizarre. Isn't that our Lord's Prayer? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. How heavy has the flood of forgiveness been? And how overflowing is it in our homes, in our lives? I hope that forgiveness is an absolutely saturating flood. And you have felt it, known it. You are transformed by it. Flood of forgiveness is so great that you are a foot deep and rising in every step that you take that you have a an outflow of it because as fast as you pump it out to somebody else it's coming right back in and in fact you're not catching up and you never will there'll always be more forgiveness than you can dole out now there is a warning to this of course and we hear that warning from jesus and matthew that if we do not forgive neither will we be forgiven if i was stupid enough to refuse a simple five gallon pail of water well, then it wouldn't be unfair for the fire department to come along, collect that fire department pump and say, fine, you're on your own. They fortunately didn't do that and I wouldn't have refused. But that's forgiveness, isn't it? 
Forgiveness is this wonderful, generous flood that overwhelms us in every possible way. Forgiveness should change the house. And it does. You know, that day, we finally got the, uh, the, the water to go down. A uh, very, very kind neighbor uh, went and ran over to Menards and uh, uh, bought a new sump pump for us because ours was submerged and, and, and not meant to be submerged, but it was. It was submerged under that foot of water. And uh, we put that new sump pump in as soon as the water finally got down. That thing ran and ran and ran and ran. It was so kind. Um, and we got her done. Okay. That's, that's wonderful. Um, the next morning we got up. Now our carpet was dry on the main floor. It, it hadn't reached that bar. And at first we got up and our feet hit the dry floor, which I got to tell you, felt very good. And at first you could kind of forget the fact that we'd been in a flood. And then it kind of came to you because I don't know if you've ever flooded your basement, but it's not quite the same the next morning. You know something is up, right? And and no matter that your dehumidifier has been working overtime, there's work to be done. It changes your house. And the thing I like, and this is strange to say, the thing I like about flood water is it gets everywhere. And when you clean up in the basement after a flood, that flood water has been everywhere. It covers everything. Wouldn't that be a wonderful picture of forgiveness? That under every piece of our life, every piece of our furniture, under every word and every part of our existence, there's the evidence of the flood of forgiveness. Lord, flood us with forgiveness, so much so that we might have that which is given to others. You know, there's another part of that story that uh, th this is true. Uh, nobody did come to me with uh, two Menards bales asking for water, but uh, this next part did happen. Uh, there were two girls, uh, five and six years old, their neighbors, uh, girls, who uh, at that morning uh, did a marvelous, unique thing. Uh, their house was not flooded. They were just up the hill enough that their house didn't flood. And the mining girls, that's her the name, uh, they put on their swimsuits and they took their pink air mattress and they blew it up and they climbed on their pink air mattress and they went sailing all around our neighborhood. They launched from, so to speak, their, the beach of their lawn, which was not underwater. And they sailed. They sailed all through our backyard. They sailed around the front. They sailed over our lawn. They sailed over our, our garden. They sailed over our flowers, our tomatoes. They were having a wonderful time sailing. The water was about three feet deep. So they, they weren't going to uh, be any trouble if they slipped off that uh, pink air mattress. Now, I got to tell you, though, let me ask you this. Um, those mining girls were trespassing, weren't they? They were. They sailed over our garden. They sailed over our flowers. They were on top of our tomatoes. They were trespassers. Should I be worried? Well, no. There was a flood. They were on top of our tomatoes. But the flood made all the difference. Funny thing about floods and flood water. It changes those who are trespassing against us. Do you have trespassers in your life? Absolutely. Have they left behind trespassing footprints? Absolutely. And you know exactly where they are. In fact, you've often gone back and revisited them and recounted every footstep of the trespassers in your life. Does the flood of forgiveness make any difference? I hope so. You know, flood water is not clear. It is very, very dark and murky. Two, three feet of flood water. Go stand at your garden now. Can you see the footprints of the trespassers? Not really. They're there. Yeah, they're there. But the flood of forgiveness is deep enough that you just can't see it. Isn't that a wonderful image? Forgive us our trespasses, Lord, in such abundance that we can forgive those who trespass against us. When they come asking for forgiveness with their two five-gallon pails, we have such a flood pouring out through our life that we can happily forgive them. And when they're gone and we remember the trespassing they've done, and we're tempted to go out and retrace those footprints, 
make them harder to find. Make them downright hard to see. Because the flood of forgiveness, the water which is tinged by the blood of your son, is just plain hard to see through. And you can't quite see the trespassers the way you did. Well, that's the flood of 96. And that's the flood of forgiveness. And now with that, it's time for us to start to move up and start heading home. We're going to do that with the next phrase. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. And just as we brought the two together, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And we had that one phrase, you come too. We're going to put these two together in a similar manner as we're going now upward and going home with another phrase, you come home. How does that work? Well, I have to tell you one more story. Um, it, in 96, our house flooded, as I said. Guess what happened in the summer of 97? Yep, flooded again. Yep, we had almost an identical flood. We were a little more prepared this time, and with two sump pumps running simultaneously, I was a little surprised I could cram two of them in there, uh, we held the, the flood off. It was right there to the windows again, but knowing what happened last year, we were a little better prepared. We held off the flood. And uh, to the everlasting credit of our town, Cedar Grove, Wisconsin, after the second flood, they said, that's enough. We got to fix this. And so they redid entirely the storm sewer system in our part of town. And by the way, we have a small town, so this was a big project. They replaced the storm sewer intake pipe in front of our house. The one that we had when it flooded was eight inches in diameter. So, you know, like that. They tore that out. And they put in one that's three feet in diameter. And I got to tell you, that was a happy day on Van Elton Avenue when we saw that three-footer going in in place. The three-foot intake pipe goes down uh, another block to the edge of town. We we're just a block from the edge of town, that field that's still there, that cornfield. And there, there's a four-foot intake, horizontal intake, for the water that's coming down the, the hill. The three-foot pipe joins that and then becomes a four foot pipe heading off a half mile down to the edge of town, makes a 90 degree turn, goes a quarter mile, empties out into our holding ponds and they empty out into Lake Michigan. We're only about a mile and a half or, or so from Lake Michigan. All good. The good news is ever since that's happened, we've not had a flood on our Van Elton Avenue. Thank you, Cedar Grove, 20 years we've been dry. That's wonderful. Now I'd like you to change something though. Imagine with me that first flood. And imagine that we do have our three-foot pipe in, and especially that we have that, that four-foot pipe just a block down uh, there. And imagine that, and this would never and should never happen, of course, somebody pulled that grid off that four-foot pipe, okay? And in other words, there's a four-foot intake, but there's no horizontal protective grid over it, right? Just an open hole, right? Two, three feet of water, right? Swirling around. And it's all heading towards that intake for which there's no guard, just an open hole. Let's pump up the air mattress and imagine the mining girls, remember five and six year old? Imagine them going sailing again that day. Of course, this is all fictitious, didn't happen. Uh, imagine them going sailing. Where is the water going to take the mining girls? Well, clearly to that four foot intake. Uh, when they get there, are they gonna see that there's no intake grid or, or protective uh, cover? No. Uh, they're five years old. Uh, are they conscious of the danger they're in? Well, of course not. They're five-year-olds. What happens if they get sucked into that pipe? They'll die. They'll never survive that rain, that that uh, that journey. What do they need? They need a dad. They need a dad who's willing to walk hip deep and deeper into that flood water, snatch those little girls up just before they get drawn in, and he's going to say to them, you come home and take them home. Now, the moment he does that, I'll guarantee you that they're going to lunge for that little pink air mattress. And dad's going to say, let it go. You come home. And I think that's what we're praying for in these last petitions. We're all children of sailing on the waters of our life. And I'll guarantee you, we don't know the dangerous currents that are moving us. And we sure don't know the unseen dangers, the hidden dangers that are in front of us. We surely don't know the traps and temptations that might be set by either us or Satan himself. 
What do we need? We need a dad. We need a father who has already waded deep into this world and has taken us by his power and hand and has held us to himself and is doing that right now and is saying to us, you come home. Now, the moment he does that, even as he's doing it right now, I know that you and I are lunging for things that we think are still crucial. We're lunging for things we have. We're lunging after things we don't yet have. And we somehow can't imagine either life now on our raft or life to come in his arms without those things. Isn't this a wonderful time for him to say, you come home. And when we lunge for them, he says, let it go. Just let it go. The most important thing to you is not clinging to the pink air mattress of your life. The most important thing is you hold on to me. And you hear me say the most wonderful words imaginable. You come home. Come home, my child. And that's what we do. And so he takes us home. And he brings us up to himself. Isn't that a marvelous thought? We've gone on almost the whole of our journey now, haven't we? I said that at the start, we're, we're going home. Uh, we called the book Our Way Home. We're ending now with that sort of storm image. It's raining. There's danger around us. But I'd like you to see the light on. Remember I mentioned that as I grew up at the end of the farm lane, that, that long driveway, there was always two lights on. Mom always had the kitchen light on. Dad always had the yard light on. By the way, when you get home, turn the lights off. You do not want Dad to wake up at 4.30 in the morning getting ready to go to the barn to find the yard light still on because you forgot, so turn the light off. But it was always on, welcoming you to come home. And that's what we see now. As we say, Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. It lifts our eyes not to the darkness that's around us. And it doesn't say that we and I have to somehow see every trap, every missing piece of our life, every disaster that's on the verge of taking us down. We can let our Father see those. Instead, wouldn't it be good to focus with these on Him, His strong arms, His willingness to step into the danger even of his son's death, grave, and need of resurrection. But he's done all that. To step into our world and to pick us up. He takes us, even though we're not perfect children. We probably got in this place, this danger, because we've ignored his advice, ignored his commands and limits. But yet, despite all that, a wonderful father wades into danger and darkness, takes us and takes us home. Hold on to him and look to him. The light is on. As we do that, we then get to end the, the, the prayer. And I, I know that not every Christian denomination has the ending uh, words that are familiar to Lutherans, but I think we can say it. After, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. It seems to me that with that, what we're doing is heading back up the steps to the choir room. Remember, we started by being welcomed into the choir. That's wonderful. And so as we step up to the choir room, what else should we sing? Well, before we start singing, maybe we should hear the choir. Here at the university, if I go down this, the hallway or outside my office and turn left and go another, oh, 50 feet, the choir room is right there. They uh, practice, of course, behind a, a, a closed door, but uh, you can hear them singing as you get closer, 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 closer. Now, of course, I am not going to open that door and step in. Uh, uh, they, they're wonderful, kind people, but we all know I can't sing. But I can hear them singing. And that's what we do as we end the prayer. For thine is a kingdom and a power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Maybe we should hear it getting a little louder, a little crescendo as we finish off. Maybe we could even say it a little louder as we get closer and closer. We're not trying to outshout the choir, and we have no intention of ever trying to outdo them. But one day we're going to literally be with the saints and angels and archangels and all that company of heaven. When we get there, we'll know what to say. And part of what we'll be singing is the prayer, but especially maybe these words. 
as we join in. And so we started with our Father who art in heaven, and we end with a reminder that out of his kindness, we'll join the choir again. And already at the end of the, at the, end of the prayer, we can hear them sing, and we can be part of that. I hope that the uh, journey of the Lord's Prayer has been a, a, a help to you. Uh, uh, it's been a pleasure for me both uh, to write it and to then share this with many, many people. Again, I would like to say thank you to uh, all my friends and co-workers at, at CPH who have done such a wonderful job of putting the, the book together. Thank you to everyone who worked on that. And I'm sure they'd love you to to go to their website and uh, to find it there um, and, and such. Blessings on your important work. Uh, that you, as you care for people in your ministries throughout our church and in many, many different settings, blessings as you pray with them and as you share the words of the Lord's Prayer. Thank you for sharing that journey with me. And again, blessings to you as you pray.